Joe Burnett. And <clears throat> Joe Dekarski. Continued prayer. The, uh, T O K A R. T T. Mary Bryson. Continue to keep Tracy Slavendog in your prayers. He is now in Chicago going through rehab. Tracy Slavendog. Let's go to prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you created for us. And Father, we thank you for allowing us to be part of it one more time. And we just pray that each and every day you give us, may we serve you, may we serve you well. And Father, we just lift up these joys, the joy of just being here today. The joy of gathering together with our church family and singing praises and worshiping you. And Father, we thank you for those that went to Edgewood Heights. We thank you for those caregivers, such as hospice <coughs> nurses, particularly one who led Lisa to your son. And Father, we thank you for being able to go on trips, bus trips, and and uh, traveling to visit family and friends. We thank you for new jobs. We thank you for the ability to celebrate anniversaries. We thank you for neighbors and church family who watch over us and take care of us and help us when we need it. Father, we thank you for watching over us and protecting us from danger, such as the one in California sparing one house. So many houses and properties were, have been destroyed. And Father, we just praise you for, for saving that one house. We thank you and, and we pray for those college students who are still traveling to get home. And we thank you for all those who are home. And we just pray for them at this time. And we thank you for your, your healing and anointing touch upon Rod. Father, we... Uh, we pray for all those and the names that are uh, published each and every Sunday morning in our bulletin. We lift them up to you for, our, for your healing and anointing touch. And we, we pray for uh, uh, David Bennett. We pray for Br Brittany, Joe Burdett, Joe Karski, Johnny Kellerman, 
Alan Bell, Lois Boyer, Mary Bryson, Lisa Colwell, Rich White, and Tracy Sloganhoff. Father, we just pray for your, your special touch to these individuals. You know exactly what they need. And Father, we know you hear our, our plea. And we lift them up to you, expecting answered <coughs> prayers. And Father, we pray for all those families who are mourning the loss of loved ones, especially at this time of the year. And Father, we lift up the Joe Aljo family at this time. <coughs> Father, we pray for our military. We pray for our army. We pray for our police forces. We pray for EMTs. We pray for the safety and welfare and the protection of all of those who respond to emergencies, who protect our communities. We pray for those who travel all over the globe to not only protect us here in America, but to protect all those free countries across the world. And we thank you for their service and their commitment. And we just pray that your, your special touch and your special anointing will be upon them and we keep them safe this Christmas season. And bring them home, bring them back home to their families. And Father, we... Uh, we do thank you and praise you for how you're going to take care of us and answer our prayers and our requests at this time. And at this time, we have unspoken requests that we would like to lift up to you in a moment of silence. Father, as we close this prayer, we now want to pray that prayer that your son taught us over 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if I can ask the children to come down front. stood a pine tree, small and forlorn. It stood alone beneath the sky until some animals gathered by. The animals had come to see the babe who slept so silently. What can we do to show our love, whispered the little turtle dove. The humble donkey thought about I know a way to make him smile. He said, we'll decorate this tree for the holy child to see. But then they heard the donkey say, I'm nothing but this pile of hay. The field mice knew just what to do. They said, we'll braid this hay for you. They wove the hay until they made one perfect shiny golden braid. The owl said, you need help, I see. I'll hang your garden, garden carefully. The lamb said, what have I to share to show the babe how much I care? Let's use the fluffy fleece you shed to trim the tree, his mother said. We'll gladly help you, said the geese, and with their beaks they gather fleece. 
The geese said proudly, it's as though the police has turned us off white snow. The baby chicks inside their nest said, how may we give him our best? Their mother said, we use your shells for ornaments that look like bells. The squirrels found bits of colored twine to string the pines, bells upon the pine. The chipmunk said, let me help now, and hung some bells on every bough. The cow said, now we need some light to make the little tree shine bright. The angels high in heaven above were touched to see the creature's love. The angels brought down stars to shine upon the lowly little pine. The stars beamed with a soft warm glow and lit the stable high and low. The loving creatures watched the child as he beheld their tree and smiled. That's how the world's first Christmas tree was made for our dear, our dear Lord to see. Joy to the world and to all its creatures, love and good wishes to you. So I'm going to give you something today for your tree. And I want you to think of the baby Jesus when you hang it. It has a little... Uh, manger scene inside of there. We're glad that you came today. And I also remember last year's lesson about the candy cane next on this page. Right. So let's say a little prayer for you guys. Dear Lord, please be with each other. Please help them make decisions that involve you and always keep Jesus in their hearts. Amen. <laughs> If you have your Bible with you and you would like to follow along, our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 and then we will be jumping down to verses 19 through 28. John chapter 1, 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. Let us hear God's word for us today. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And then moving down to verse 19. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you uh, Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah <coughs> nor the prophet. And John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know. The one who is coming after me, 
I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And this took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you have selected for us today. And Father, we pray to you today, all of us standing and sitting here in this sanctuary, pray that you will open and soften the minds and the hearts of us here today. Father, I just pray, as usual, always, that my words and my actions will always be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Many scholars consider verses 1 through 18 of John chapter 1 the most important passage in the Gospel of John. Verses 6 through 8 introduce John as the man sent by God to give witness to and testify about a Messiah that will be the light of the world. Many, including some Pharisees who were supposed to be scholars of the law, believed that John was the Messiah, the coming light that would deliver Israel. But the scripture tells us that he himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. In fact, if we read on in verse 9, we are told the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. And God sends John to make way for himself, to prepare the way for his son, whom he is sending who is coming to the world to not just deliver Israel, but to deliver the whole entire world. John is sent by God to pave the way for the, the one who will bring the word into flesh. John becomes the primary witness to the one who comes from and is God. John brings testimony to the the divine language that will soon become reality. He fulfills prophecy. This one that is coming, his name is Jesus, the Christ, and he will bring hope, peace, joy, and love to a fallen world. Verses 19 through 28 act as a trial of John before the religious leadership of Israel. In this passage, the Pharisees send priests and Levites to find out who John is. They ask him if he is the Messiah, Elijah, or a prophet. And he confesses that he is in any of these. And finally, they they asked him then, who do you call yourself? And John said to them in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now we need to pause right here. And we need to reflect on our biblical knowledge and ask an important question. You see, the Pharisees were known to be the authoritative practitioners of the law. They were experts in the law. They were obedient servants of the law. How is it that being the scholars and servants of the law that they said they were and they claimed to be, they could not recognize John and did not know who John truly was? Was. Did they not read the scripture of Isaiah? How could they overlook what Isaiah prophesied 
about the coming Messiah. Of course, we have to remember that they also didn't recognize or know who the Messiah was when he came into their lives. So the priests and the Levites who were sent by the Pharisees asked John, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answers them in verses 26 through 27. He says, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. It's in this verse that John himself reminds them of the fact that they, the experts of the law, do not know who he is. John informs the religious leaders that although you do not know me, there is one coming that will be much greater than me. And this one who is coming will baptize you with something far greater than I can. And you really need to get to know him. There are two points that can be made from this passage. The first point is that there is no excuse for the Pharisees to not know who John was and why he was doing what he was doing. For the prophet Isaiah made it clear in Isaiah 40 that there would be one who would come before the Messiah, one who would prepare the way for the coming light, one who would blaze the way for the Messiah. One who would build a straight highway for the Lord. So if the Pharisees were so knowledgeable of the law, if they were such experts in the law, why could they not recognize John as the one Isaiah spoke of hundreds of years earlier? Because they were blinded by the law. And we too can get blinded by our laws. We too can get blinded by the scripture. We can get blinded by our busy lives. We can get blinded by the static around us and in our lives. The other point is another question. What were the religious leaders looking for as they examined and questioned John about his ministry. They obviously weren't looking for a man like John. How could they have known who John truly was? Mark's Gospel tells us he was dressed in a camel hide. He wore a great big thick leather belt around his waist. And he lived in the wilderness. And he ate locusts and wild honey. How could they have known John as the forerunner to the Messiah? It's obvious they were blinded to Isaiah's message about one who would live in the wilderness and make straight the pathway to this coming Messiah. One might conclude that the Pharisees were, were actually expecting this forerunner to come with all the pomp and circumstance of a king much as they expected the Messiah to come, wearing fine clothing and jewelry and eating the, the best of foods, much like they expected Jesus to come. They weren't looking for a wilderness survival. survival. Isn't it funny how our expectations can affect our perception? Many of us do and, and are capable of developing preconceived ideas of what somebody or something should look like. Oftentimes, our perception prevents us from truly recognizing Jesus in our lives or his work in our lives. We often develop a picture 
and we store it in our mind of what certain people or places may look like. A kindergarten teacher was observing her children in her classroom one day while they were drawing. She would occasionally walk around and she would check and look at the children's artwork. And as she came to this one little girl who was working so diligently and, and, and quietly, she, she hadn't said a word uh, the whole time they started this project. And she asked her what the drawing was. And the little girl replied, I'm drawing God. The teacher stepped back and she paused and, and then she said to her, Sweetie, but no one knows what God looks like. Without missing a beat, and even looking up to her, she continued drawing. And the girl replied to her, They will when they see this picture. <laughs> Do you have a picture of John in your mind? What about God? What about Jesus? When you speak of God or when you speak of Jesus, what, does they, what do they look like to you? But more importantly than what they look like, I have to ask you, do you truly know who Jesus is? Or are you like the Pharisees and other religious leaders who claim expertise of the law who showed great visible signs of faith in public, yet they didn't know who John or Christ really was. Maybe you know the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation very well. Maybe you are the one who is, is gifted, unlike me, of quoting many scriptures in the Bible. Maybe you're one who follows particular traditions that you have been taught in Sunday school and as you grew up in the church. But I have to ask you, do you really know who Jesus Christ is? As we anticipate and celebrate the birth of Jesus this year, let's ask ourselves, how well do I know Jesus? First of all, we have to ask ourselves, do we know Jesus as a Savior? Have you given your heart and your soul to Jesus? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Are your daily activities and, and done and acted out in a manner where you are consistently and continuously attempting to please Him? Are you living with the peace and comfort that Jesus brings to a life that has been saved, given to him, <coughs> belonging to his kingdom? Secondly, do you know Jesus as a teacher? Are you living your life in a manner he has taught you to live? Are you learning about life from Jesus? Do you hunger each and every day to read and study his word? Does his word educate you about the life and ministry of Jesus? Does his word empower you and build you up so that your life reflects what Jesus teaches? Thirdly, do you know Jesus as a shepherd? Is your daily activities guided by him and his word? Does his word convict you when you stray from that straight and narrow path? Do you allow Jesus to lead you among decisions? Do you consult him through prayer when you have a difficult decision to make? Do you depend on him in a time of need, during health issues, or when you're faced with a crisis? Is Jesus the first one you go to for leadership and guidance? Does Jesus help you step out of your box? Does Jesus help you come out of your comfort zone to answer a call to ministry? Or to reach out to someone in need? Or to show love and compassion to someone who isn't very lovable at all?
Fourth, do you know Jesus as a judge? Does Jesus and his word hold you accountable for your 